You guys ready? Okay, can everybody hear me now? Good. My name is Chris J, and I know the title in the guide said wireless. It's really just Wi-Fi. We'll talk about uh, that in a second. Normally when people say wireless, wireless though, they're talking about Wi-Fi, um, unless you're an amateur radio person. So, hey, this talk sounds familiar, didn't I read this somewhere? Yes, you did. I wrote this up last year for the Linux Journal. Um, and it's actually out there on their website. It's got some little ad extras in there. Um, if you've followed me before on Twitter, or well, if you follow me on Twitter, you understand why I'm dressed like this. If you haven't followed me on Twitter, well, this is my Twitter profile picture from last year. It was a Halloween costume. And when Chris said, hey, we need a picture for you for our, our schedule, I'm like, here, here's one that they took at work that's kind of professional looking, and here's the one, that, here's my Halloween costume. It's like, yeah, we're going to go for your corporate hacker picture. It's like, okay. So I'm a white hat. Um, who's the man behind the mask? I have a BS in information assurance from Eastern Michigan University. I'm actually currently a grad student at uh, the University of Maryland, and this costume is actually very, very hot. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, the guy behind the mask, that's me. I got my OSWP in 2010. I've been playing with wireless pretty much since 1998. Um, I helped design college classes at a community college. I've done a lot of other things, and uh, these black gloves are hot too. The insides of them are actually covered in sweat already. I've had them for less than 10 minutes. So going beyond that, who else am I? Uh, I used to do wireless penetration testing for General Motors as a contractor. Their biggest issue was they wanted to make sure people weren't hooking up their own um, wireless access points to the network. And that was actually a big problem with, with GM because they'd have people, um, they didn't want to walk a mile through the plant between their office and the machine they had to work on. So they'd normally set up an access point and say, well, I'm not going to walk back and forth. I'm just going to bring my laptop with me. The problem was they also use the same wireless network, the same frequencies to control the robots that drive through the plants. And now you've got interference. So that's, uh, that's that. I do like to give a couple shout shout outs. Biggest one is Larry Pesci. Now it's funny because this was actually started as a grad graduate, well not graduate, but when I zoomed my undergrad, I was one credit hour short of graduation. So this was a one credit hour directed study at Eastern Michigan University. Um, I don't see Joe Eastman in here, he was my advisor at the time. But during the research review, it's like, yeah, there's other people that did similar things. Larry actually, his paper through SANS was it, it fixed all the problems I was having after I built everything on the Raspberry Pi. So he did it with the WRTs, the old Linksys routers. And it's like, I'm having all these weird issues. And I go and find Larry's paper while trying to find troubleshooting documentation. Um, there's been some other people I've helped along the way. Some guys at Spire Labs doing ra Raspberry Pi war driving. Um, so why are you here? That didn't work right. Um, hopefully you like security tools. Who can tell me what that logo is? There's a Raspberry Pi in it. Who can tell me what the logo is? Everybody says Tetris. It's not Tetris. Tron. Who said Tron? Come get your Raspberry Pi. So it's the B+. Plus. See, I was, I was beginning to think I was the only one that watched Tron Uprising, because that's where the logo is really popular. They are. Um, you can actually see the logo on Tron's chest in the first movie and in the last movie, very briefly. Um, so hopefully you like security tools, you like Raspberry Pis, or you like wireless networks. Me, yeah, I like all three. So why do we want to do wireless scans, right? Well, I like security tools, but it doesn't mean I have to go out and build one. Um, going through all the regulations, all the requirements, all the industry regulations, government regulations, and I don't care what you say, PCI, DSS is a regulation because if you don't follow it, you can't have your, your ability to do business taken away from you. So it may not be a government regulation, but that is an industry one. It's not just a guideline. Um, PCI, DSS actually requires you to do quarterly scanning. I don't like quarterly scans, and we'll cover that in a second. Data loss prevention, you don't want your IP walking out the door or through the parking lot when somebody is sitting there in a siege engine called their car. Anybody see Nate's talk earlier, Dr. Whom? No? Okay. He's like, I don't know what the current equivalent of a siege engine would be because he was talking about medieval stuff. And it's, uh, well, it would be a car with the guy sitting in the parking lot. And then policy compliance are people putting up devices that work and expanding your perimeter without your permission. 
You want to also do wireless scans because you want to verify documentation. You start off with a new company, you want to know what's there, you got to map the network. Well, that doesn't just mean map your wires, that means map your wireless. You want to find interference problems before they become problems. Companies turning up Wi-Fi will usually do testing before they turn it up, and if you start seeing problems when they're going through their builds, you can hopefully stop them before they do their deployment. Because going to a company in the same office park as you afterward and saying, you're causing interference on my, my systems because you're using the same channels, they don't really care. They're not going to spend the money to redo it. But if you catch them early enough and when they're in their testing phase, you can say, hey, you're, you're causing problems. We've got to work together to fix this. Um, find interesting things. Let's see. What's an interesting thing? Guy sticking a Nokia N900 in the bathroom ceiling tiles. Uh, another guy plugging in what looked like a power charger that was really broadcasting Wi-Fi and had it plugged into the wire that way. So it's like, you know, he made a nice little toy, but um, going beyond this, if you go into more wireless testing beyond just, just Wi-Fi and you get some more other tools that we'll talk about at the end of the talk, you can start finding people broadcasting from within your building on other frequencies besides just this. So you find even more interesting things. Um, and find user problems. So I actually like this one. I was a contractor at Ford for a while. I had a guy call me up one day, not even my department, right? We maintain the, pro the proxies. He's like, and the wireless devices. And he's like, yeah, so I'm hearing problems with the wireless. I'm like, okay, whatever. Nobody else is. What's your problem? Well, it works fine when I go through my phone. It's like, why are you using your phone as a hotspot that's against policy? Well, I got to test this, and I can't get it to work through the company, company wireless. I'm like, okay, so you've already made one policy violation. What else are you doing? Turned out he didn't have his proxy set up on his browser. So as soon as we set that up, it started working. He's like, oh, I don't get this. It's like, and you're a developer? You got to have all your hooks in place, or else it doesn't work. So um, that's one, some of the reasons to do wireless scanning. You know, if I would have caught the guy doing the cell phone as a hotspot sooner, we could have sent somebody over, talked to him, and figured out his problem without having him spend three weeks calling people or breaking compliance. Uh, real times versus snapshots. These are the reasons why I don't like snapshots. Things like to move around. They like to move around as you're doing your snapshot in some cases. When I was at General Motors, we'd go through a plant. We got to be real, really well known because there's only about 10 of us, and there's a lot of GM plants. So we'd go around every quarter, we'd walk in, and the people working the floor would get to know us because that engineer is nice enough to share the Wi-Fi password if you had one, or you just left it wide open so those guys could get on and surf the net too. Um, and the guys on the floor would be like, hey, those IT guys with the, the weird antennas are here again. Um, you might want to do something about that. You might want to like come over and take that thing because you know that one guy that likes to carry that five pound hammer that smashes stuff. He told you he's going to fire you next time he caught you. Yeah, that was me. Um, no, not the engineer, the guy with the hammer. Because <laughs> I would take security with me and people would get walked out. Um, in, in fact, this one guy actually kept bringing the device in. He brought it in four different times. The people before me caught him, I caught him once. I smashed it in front of him. I said, Do you ever do this again? You've already been told no. Take this home and you keep bringing it back. Now it's been destroyed. And if you do this again, security will be walking you out as I continue my, my scan of the building. And he just looked at me and was like, You can't do that. I'm like, Yes, I can because you're violating policy. Um, phobias, I hate heights. Anybody ever stand on a plant of a, or on a, um, automotive plant roof? So you're a good 40, 50 feet up, and you have to walk along that edge, and you don't usually have to unclip at one point and clip in at another point, because, you know, you gotta go around that AC device, and, yeah. I don't like heights. Um, I also got hit by one of those nice, happy little trolley carts that pulls all the parts from one machine to another one. It cut the back of my pants open and left a little scar on the back of my leg. And lastly, timing. Um, so I do my snapshot at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Do I know what happened at 6.30 in the, at night? Do I know what happened at 3 a.m. in the morning? You know, what else is going on in this office park besides us doing business? For all we know, there's a guy down the street using his office building as a rave. Uh, you haven't there done that. So hardware specs, let's talk about that because this is where it gets fun. Raspberry Pi 2s. This used to be done on the Raspberry Pi B, so this is now version 2. Um, the first version was done on the Raspberry, P, the Raspberry Pi B. Then the B pluses came out as I was finishing projects, like, man, as soon as I can afford six of those, because I was a college student, still am, um, I'll go out and I'll buy a bunch of B pluses and I'll redo this. And by the time I could afford that, it's like, well, this is great. Um, the Raspberry Pi 2s are out now and they're supposed to be better. So I went out and skipped the B pluses and went straight to the 2s. In fact, he got one of the B pluses from my collection. Um, TP-Links, I like these cards. I really like these cards, especially when you're using Kismet. And especially when you're using Kismet on Kali, because this card doesn't require recompiling. So if I was using Raspbian or Arch or any of the other distros on 
the Raspberry Pi, I'd have to sit there and recompile the card, and I really hate doing that because it's so slow. You know, I can compile things. I'm a former Linux administrator, um, but I don't like compiling when packages are already done, or I can just download the distri distribution with it on it. Now, the downside to these cards, they're the uh, TLN or no, TL 722Ns. The downside of these cards is they only do half N, they don't do full N. Power, you've got a couple different options. The Raspberry Pis don't do PoE, but you can buy PoE splitters, so it breaks off the PoE. It's another device that you plug in right, right before the Pi. It'll be patched through a regular network cable. You can put the power into the power port. Uh, so cost comparison. Cisco is the big kid on the block. Um, if you want to do six Raspberry, or if you want to do six devices at uh, at, with Cisco equipment, you've got to go out and you've got to have a mobility service engine that can either be a physical appliance, a card that you plug into your switch, or it can be a virtual appliance ran on one of your boxes. You need a LAN controller. So we're talking $3,000 for a virtual and about four and a half for a physical, right? And then we got that LAN controller for another thousand that plugs into my switch. Well, now I've lost two switch, switch lots. And then I need an access point, and well, you can see the prices there. Yeah, that's kind of expensive. Or you can do it for Raspberry Pi. Uh, they do have some limitations, but they're great for proof of concept if you want to justify spending the additional money. Go out and spend it for about $35, buy your Pies. Um, the store I get mine at are $30 each. They're always on sale for some reason. The TP links cost me about $15, or it is the, TW, the WN722N. Power supplies, the ones that have the Raspberry Pi logos on them are $9.99, or $9 depending on the store you go to. And then $8 case to hold that little single board computer, right? So price comparisons. To build six drones, and that's what Kismet calls them. That's why they're called drones. Uh, the Kismet nomenclature is drone. The Raspberry Pi, $470 out the door. The Cisco, device, Cisco same six devices is going to cost you Eleven and a half thousand dollars, depending on who your VAR is. Um, the wireless engineers at Ford said that Cisco was selling them they want twenty thousand dollars for those for those uh, mobility engines, not four thousand. So, what's this run? I mentioned before it's got Kali on it. Quick history of, of Kali and why I'm running it. Uh, Kismet pa passive capture, and then air dump. Again, another passive capture. Now, I really, really love Kismet. Don't get me wrong, Mike's a great guy. He's done a lot of great work. It just misses one feature I really, really wish it had. And we'll talk about that in a second, which is why I also have to use AeroDump for this. So welcome to Roosevelt Hall. And we'll see a picture of Roosevelt Hall in a minute, but this is uh, when I actually went and presented to my advisor for my grade. I'm like, well, here's what we got. We got three devices plugged in, because that's what space allowed us for. We've got all this different equipment. I can see all these different cool things on here. I've got a couple of hidden SSIDs, which I could have dug into more if I wanted to. I had the Plant Secure, which is what um, they use to do their HVAC systems at EMU. I've got the Secure Wireless Network, which is supposed to be for faculty. Most of the students need the passwords anyway. And then the Open Wireless stuff. And that's fun. All right, and then I can see on the screen real fast, it's kind of hard to see because it's dark text on a dark background, but this last column over here is seen by. And I4 saw it, I2 saw it, I3 saw it. And that's just how I name my devices for working with Kismet because that's a 10 character hard set field that you can't change. Um, so yeah, that's that. And you guys can ask questions at any point, it's good. Sorry, again, it's going to be hard to see. So I looked at one of the networks, I, I drilled into it, and this is where Kismet fails me. There's this little tiny spot up here. Find it real fast. It's actually hard to read this close to it because it's all pixelated. Um, I'll point it with the mouse. There is the power level setting. Right there. So that says ne negative 86 dBm. Well, gee, thanks, Kismet. That tells me that it's a negative 86 power setting. It's telling me that there's a bit of distance between you and the you know, the little drone. If you guys have noticed, or here where I'm setting up, there's actually four devices sitting in this room right now collecting data um, because we're going to do a live portion in a minute. But that tells me that 
one of the devices that saw it saw it at negative negative eighty four dBm, which is great. But where do the other ones do it? How am I supposed to triangulate this? How am I supposed to actually find this thing? If Kismet's only giving me the power reading of one device, enter AeroDump. And you log into AeroDump one by one. Now, in this case, I had already locked AeroDump onto the SSIDs that I wanted. I can now see a negative 91, a negative 71, and I think the last one was a negative 84. Oh, negative 59. So what that tells me is who's closest to this device. So how did this work? Well, that's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be a picture. There it is. Um, that's Roosevelt Hall. It's where the information assurance group's out of. It's also where the ROTC group's out of. It's a nice old building built in 1918. It's a former high school on EMU's campus. I was actually in a lab in this room here. The professor hid the rogue access point by the other lab. And we were able to figure out where it was by using geometry. So I mentioned aircraft, but I want to mention a couple warnings. Aircraft's nice, it's fun to use, but you need to be careful. So anybody hear about the hotel chains and conference centers that were getting fined recently by the FCC? Got a guy nodding his head, yes, anybody else? Conference company because they were blocking it. So what they were doing is basically injecting to prevent you from using your own device, which is a built-in feature to that Cisco device that you bought. Um, here we do it manually through Aerodome. So the actual relevant law is 47 USC, US, compile, or US, US code, subsection 333. And the main point is, is you don't want to, uh, you can't cause interference. And then you have the chairman saying, consumers must get what they pay for. So I, pay for, I paid AT&T for the service. You cannot, because of the way the laws are written, block my service just because you want me to use yours instead. Uh, here's the two fines. Marriott was fined six thousand dollars back in October, and then October of last year, actually it was December of last year. Last year, uh, a little bit later on, Smart City Holdings, which is the conference company, was fined seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So you're seeing those numbers go up too. Now, I stayed at a Holiday Inn last night, but that doesn't make me a lawyer. Um, will this hold for businesses who have policies against Wi-Fi? We don't know yet because it's not been tested. I don't want to be the guy to test it. Um, I don't want to have to work with legal to find out, but check with your legal teams to see if, because if you guys want to actually sit there and try to take this stuff offline as you see it coming up in your, in your networks, uh, that's between you and your legal department. And make sure they know they can get fined large numbers. So, live demo time. Have I placated the gods? Uh, I've given this talk four times now. This is not talk number five. I'm at 50% working. Uh, and this time I'm, I'm really testing it because I've got Raspberry Pi 2s. Uh, brand new laptop and brand new VM infrastructure. Anybody have any dead chickens handy? Anybody get that reference? If you have any network problems, rub, rub a dead chicken over it. So let's see if this is working. Well, let's make this bigger so you can read it. It's a good start though, it's pulling data. <laughs> Is that more readable to people? Okay, good. Oops. So, somebody's got a box name virus, that's awesome. Uh, is there anybody in this room? C colon virus? So it picks up your stuff wirelessly. I've got these laid out throughout the room. Uh, you can see the boss. You can see change name, not your B. Um, so lots of different fun names. People have fun with it. That's cool. Fun is fun. So right now I'm set to auto fit. If I switch over to BSID mode, it gives me different BSIDs and standard MAC addresses. I think a lot of these are going to be phones. Well, Verizon MiFi there. Virus one. Um, I actually didn't set up mine. Yeah. I forgot something. But let's say we want to look at this one. Let's let's look at this one specifically. So drill into it. 
There's that screen again where we got the negative 98 dBm down here near the bottom. And this is what I can see so far. Um, not enough information, but I can scroll down, so let's scroll down. The drones that see it are all four. I got I1, I2, I3, I4. Again, they're named that because you have that 10 character limit in the last scene by field. So everybody sees it. But back to the whole point of everybody sees it, but I've got a max of 74, and I got a max, or I don't know if that's an average or, or what, but a negative 98. So let's see if I can actually get this to work. This is where it gets fun. Um, turn back up. Grab the BSSID. Switch microphones. Because it's hard to hold and talk at the same time. No, nope, it's not. Let me select it. That's fine. Be a pain. Uh, make sure this is the same screen size. I'm right, so worried about Kismet working, I kind of skip everything else. So let's see. Hi, one. Freaking log in. This is another limitation of the Raspberry Pi. Um, because the USB cards and the network cards are on the same bus, it's a little slow. So let's do. SSID. Two C, five C, C five. I hate this part of my presentations because I'm usually fo more focused on trying to type than I am talking. So it's a lot of dead, si dead silence, and I'm sorry about that. It's just the way it is. Um, anybody have a good joke to tell? Yeah. Come on up and tell a joke. No? Nobody? Um, I actually prefer when people are more engaged in the audience. Ask questions now. If you see something you want me to go a little bit deeper into, I might tell you it's, there's more slides on that later. Um, or I might actually take this time to go into it now. So let's be smart about this. If I get the command right, this will work. If I get it right, I don't want to have to type it every time. I didn't do the command right. <sighs> See, this is the problem with doing a talk a year after you do the project. Actually, it's 19 months after I done the project. Because I've moved on to other things and I kind of forgotten what I was doing. Uh, interface W. Okay. And then it just gets boring for you guys. Because you gotta sit there and wait for some guy on, on, a, on a stage to type out stuff. Okay, so it's doing the channel hop because I didn't set it to a specific channel. Because I don't know how the system set up. There we go. We now see it as negative 75 here on number one. Let's go to number two. And like I said, this is where I'm using AeroDump. That's loading. Go to number three. Another thing I don't like is it's only a 10 one hard connection. It's not a. Uh, it's not gig. And new keyboard, so I'm having problems learning. Or knowing where to type because normally I can normally I can type without looking at the keyboard, but it's a new keyboard layout to me, so I haven't learned it yet. Sorry, I'm just kind of rambling on while you guys are waiting, watching me type things. And Pi Four. So we get screens to resize too.
And while there's lots of data here that you can grab, the only thing I really care about is the um, power levels. So I've got a negative 75, a negative 77, and negative 73. So let's see. I would say it's actually the other side of this wall. And off in this direction, because that's my lowest power level, because that's where 2 is. Actually, is it, that is pi 2, right? It'll say 2-2 on top. That's 2.3. Okay, then I mix them up and I was pu pushing them out. Because I was trying to get 1 and 2 in the front and 3 and 4 in the back. That's 4. Okay, so it's pi over this way then. They're checking the numbers for me real fast because they didn't really pay attention to where I was mapping them out. It's like, here, go set this as and that cable I just threw out. Did you, anybody miss me throwing cables at the beginning of the talk? It's like, just throwing these cables out and these guys are... That's two back there. Okay, so I said it was out here. It's actually out that door. And I'm making that justification on the fact, and that's one. Okay. So one is up here in this, this top corner. That's pi two. They get the stronger readings, and two is stronger, so I'm going to go out that door, start looking for that device. Now you can use your cell phone at that point using any of the tools that they have out there, like um, Wi-Fi Detect, which is way better than walking around with a laptop with an AeroDump card in it. He knows he's done that. Um, or you can actually walk around with something else. I actually want to build a hand, a hand scanner out of Raspberry Pi. Not because it's going to be like more stealthy or anything, but just because it would be cooler. So I can do that with any VSS ID I pick up, even the non-broadcasting names, because I'm still going to have the, the VSS ID identifier. I might not have the SS ID. The, join the, the network, but I'll still have its MAC address somewhere. So, um, back to this slide where we were talking about this before. The problems I have with Kismet, like I said, this last scene by column, 10 characters, including the spaces. That's hard set, can't be changed. Might be able to be changed if I actually knew how to do programming, but I'm not a programmer. Um, Again, it doesn't tell you the power is. So it makes it a little, you can't use just a main screen to go find what you're looking for. So limitations, last seen by the network view, doesn't give you power readings for all your devices, it just gives you power readings for the one. Um, so to work around those, I used AeroDump on the show, uh, on the Raspberry Pis like we just saw. Hardware limitations, I love this network card, it works out of the box. It doesn't do A, it doesn't do AC, and it only gets half of N, so if it's a 5 gigahertz network, you're not going to see it. Um, and none of the cards that are out currently, based on testing I've done and testing that um, Zero Chaos, Rick, from the Pin2 project has done, we haven't found any yet. We're actually working separately, but we haven't found any yet. They'll actually do both bandwidths at the same time. I can lock on to one side, or I can lock on to the other side, but I can't do both together. Um, there's no Bluetooth in these. I've had a couple of amateur extras. Anybody here in here a ham besides me? Got one. General extra tech. Very old tech. Um, so the extras I hang out with at my radio club, they're like, oh yeah, Bluetooth's on the same frequency. It's like, not according to the charts I've seen. They're on no, but you get bleed over. It's like, not according to the charts I've seen. <laughs> And I can't pick them up with a Wi-Fi card. So I can't see Bluetooth. I can't see the Zigbees. Um, they're all using the same, the same frequency bands. But I can't see those because they're just off enough in the way these radios are set up. And I can't pick up cellular, cellular data. So why does any of that matter? I can't catch a guy using his Bluetooth on his cell phone. I can't catch a guy bringing Zigbees into the office and hooking them up. I can't catch a guy using the cell phone for data instead of voice. But I can see his cell phone when he's using it as a hotspot. You know what I mean? So if he's got the hotspot set up, I can see it. If he's got it tethered, I can't. So if, I, if he brought the USB cable in, plugged it into his cell phone, plugged it in that way, I can't detect that. That's the limitations of this for hardware. System failures. 
the Raspberry Pi. Um, so it's, again, it's a, it's a hardware failure on the system. The Pi, the B Plus, and the Pi 2s, if you don't plug them in right, they will crash. So they actually plug them in properly. I have to plug them in. Either network, it, it, everything has to be plugged into it before you power up the, the, the device. Otherwise, there's too much of a power draw, it crashes. Fix that, you'd have to use a power hub. That means your price is going to go up. Um, USB and networks on the same bus, so you're going to constantly trip over yourself. You saw how slow it was to connect SSH to those devices. It's because all the traffic's pushing through the same way. If I plug in a USB dongle with, with Ethernet on it, it does nothing for me because I'm still fighting the bus on the backside. Um, if it's a large enough target rich environment, let's say a cafeteria at a large automotive company's headquarters, as you're giving the presentation, good luck. You're not going to talk to the device at all. You're going to have so much data coming back to you that you'll never get your commands back through that mess to the other side. So I might see, in that particular case, I saw Pi 6. It was sending me all the data from all the devices over there. I couldn't actually SSH into it to do anything with it. Um, and again, if you power off a Raspberry Pi without actually doing a proper shutdown, you risk corrupting your SD card. Here's where it gets fun. Problems moving to the, the Pi 2s and Kali 2.01. So, want to go out, want to do some fun. Kali no longer does the entire SD card because they realize people are getting different size cards. I'm using 16s. And just because you buy a card that says it's 16 gigabits doesn't mean it's 16 gigabits. Two of the cards I bought were actually 14. Still sold as 16. Had the same manufacturer sticker on it as the ones that have the 15.9, but they're only 14.9s. Um, and then we get into the mess of System D. Anybody in here use System D? Do you like it? Eh. Um, so, if you find any of the old documentation for Raspberry Pis and starting anything at boot, they tell you to go drop your file in Etsy slash, or slash Etsy slash rc.local, which is great if you're using a sysvnit sys file system, right? Your init system goes through there, calls that file, starts your stuff. Problem is, that doesn't really work on systemd. Systemd still calls that file, but if it takes more than two seconds to run, it kills it. So you can either, either have to start your command and put it to sleep, or you have to go through and say it's uh, not quite working right. And spend about 20 hours of troubleshooting to get to work. Only to find out that systemd is killing it because it's taking too long to run, run all these different tricks to try to make it work, and it still fails on you. Um, and then Kismet, if we go back to my Kismet screen real fast, Sorry. Uh, if you watch at the bottom, you're going to see channel errors. There we go. So if you look at the bottom, look at the bottom of the screen, you can see it says, "I can't set to channel 165. I can't set to channel 161." Those are A channels. It's not an A card. We'll look at that config in a second. Um, but I can't do the channel list there. So it's fun, but if you block out the channel list on that config, let's go look at one real fast. So this bottom channel list down here is all my ABs. Where did my mouse go? There it is. This is all your AB channels. So it's picking up all the B network stuff through 10. But then 36, which is your A's, your, your um, higher ends, it just doesn't see those. If I comment this line out, Kismet won't start it as a Kismet drone. And I found that out last night at about 2 o'clock in the morning as I was making sure this presentation was going to work. So I haven't had time to sit down and figure out why that is and how to fix it. Doesn't mean it can't be fixed, it's just I haven't gotten there yet. Um, so if you want to deploy your own, here's my suggestions, because I do actually have people contact me on a regular basis, and they say, hey, I read your article in Linux journal, and we want to do something like this as a proof of concept at work. 
Um, do it this way. Use, my, use the same hardware, knowing the limitations. Use Kali 2.0.1. Do their base, base install. Now, it doesn't come with the Raspi config file, or the Raspi config program, or RPI um, Wiggle to expand your, heart, your drive. But that's not a problem. Do the base start, install the card only, and then use my handy dandy scripts. And these scripts work, they're on my GitHub. Um, and like I said, I'm not a programmer. These are, the, these are just really ugly shell scripts. <laughs> and we'll see them in a second. Um, but there's two in there. There's an old program called um, RPI Wiggle, which is designed to expand your drives. It hasn't been maintained in about three years. It's a great program. And it was using RCE Local. So maybe I can fix that with Sistine now that I know what I'm doing with that. Um, it's interactive, it installs the software you need from Kali and pulls a file from the Debian repositories, installs them for you, tells them tells you what changes you need to make on your on your drone, and then drops you into the configuration file. Uh, Confo config drone sh is actually more interactive. It will ask you things as you go along, type them in, and happy times because it will actually create all the configuration files for you. It will do all the setup for you, and it takes your time of setup from 45 minutes to an hour to about 15 to 20 minutes. So it's faster. Um, so, ooh, my demo too. This one's cheating uh, because we're, there's no network connection to the outside world, and we'll do it on four. So this is the, the final drone configuration for file for Kismet, right? It's not what they look like when they start, start out. Right. Click, escape. So let's see, should so I can't really see what I'm typing, so This is what the file looks like when you first install Kismet for your drone file. A lot of stuff, a lot of information in here that's really not needed. Um, again, we see that combo channel list at the bottom. So let's go look into, if you saw the LS previously, down here at the very end there is the WIDS Raspberry Pi. Anybody not used Git before? I'm kind of new to it, so this git clone and then the, um, the URL creates a file, which the file, which Raspberry Pi. Like I said, the first one, it comes through here. It tells you what it's going to do. Hey, I'm going to download and install Trigger Happy, allow 5.1 from the Kali repositories. Then it goes and does it. And it's going to download the Raspi config. It um, says, hey, I'm going to download this file from here. Again, then it runs out and it grabs the Raspi config file. So if I say, hopefully this doesn't break things. It's going to download and install trigger happy for you. It'll probably fill out because it doesn't have a network connection. Or it's going to pull it from repositories. Actually, it's doing the update first, which I know is going to fail. When it's done, it drops you into, it'll tell you what you need to change. It says change your file system. And when you install Kali, it actually installs for a desktop mode, so it automatically logs you, well, I don't know if it automatically logs you into your desktop or not, but it loads you into an X Windows system. So it, you want to change your, your file system, and then you want to come down and change your enable boot, to boot desk, or boot desktop scratch. Finish that, do your reboots. Gives you your full size card instead of just using a portion of it. And then run back through. And then this is the other script that actually does all the configurations for you. And like I said, it's ugly programming. Um, 
And along the way, it tells you each step it's doing. Hey, I'm going to be asking you some configuration questions in a minute, but first I need to go and install um, Kismet, NTP, and Vim. And the fun thing is, is, if you don't have a network connection, the Raspberry Pis don't know the date and time based on the last time they were powered on. They don't actually keep updating the date daily like a laptop would. Um, so if I were to do a date command on these right now, they'd all think they're stuck in October, October 8th. Um, I'm going to ask you how to set up your stuff. Let's run it. Hey, in a moment I'm going to be asking you some questions. I'm going to download stuff. Everything's already at the newest version. I put sleep comments in there just so things didn't scroll by too fast. I might go back through and change those times. Um, I know it's going to work because I built all these boxes the other night with this. Can't do the NTP time updates. What do we want to call this drone? We want to call this drone Raspy 2 4. What's the SAC IP address for this device? IT 168.1.224 asks you for your NetMask. And I forgot to mention this earlier, but all the Raspberry Pis, because of what they do, are statically, statically IP'd. So these are deploy and forgets. Um, this is where, what, does, what do I tell the Kismet server my name is? What do, what's my server name for this drone? So in this case, it's I4. What's my Kismet server IP? My server in this case is 65. Last steps. I'm, so at this point, it's already created or recreated my network files for my interface card. So the Ethernet is already statically IP addressed. The configuration file is completely rewritten. Um, the systemd configuration is written to actually start on boot. And now it wants to know what's my root password. And then it goes through and changes your SSHA, SSHA keys because the ones that come with it are pre-configured and everybody has them. Well, I don't want that. I want something that's fresh and unique to this. So it goes through and recreates the RSA keys for your SSH. And when it's done, you have a completely configured box. It'll reboot the device. Press enter to reboot your new drone. I actually don't want to do that. Um, and that's what that one script does. If you had to sit there and write that all out by hand, you have to worry about typos, you have to worry about syntax. There's your systemd unit file. It wrote all that for me. It's already been tested, so I don't have to worry about any kind of issues. I mentioned before that this doesn't like having, normally when you call a drone and you run it remotely like, like I am, this command up here would be, for exec start, would be user bin kismet underscore drone space dash dash demonize, system D doesn't like that, and it kills the process. Just a gotcha I came across. Um, we're done with you now, so you can go away. So I actually took the time, did all the troubleshooting, and made it easy to play scripts for people if they want to use this on Raspberry Pis. Have fun with it. You find problems, let me know. Uh, future things to test, I want to get a new Bluetooth one. Now, I've been told that these work on Raspberry Pis. I've been told they don't work on Raspberry Pis, so I want to get a new Bluetooth one to do the Bluetooth scanning. I want to get a Kisby if, if Dragorn ever finishes production on these things. These will do Kismet on, these are the devices who actually pick up the, the radio signals and do the um, Kismet scanning on XB devices. Um, and then I want to get a hack RF one. Again, I've been told that this works on a Raspberry Pi. No, this doesn't work on a Raspberry Pi. To see what other frequencies I can pick up between 30 megahertz and I think it was 10 gigahertz or 6 gigahertz. So 10 megahertz and 6 gigahertz, that gives me way more 
radio frequencies that talk to you. Remember how I said this is Wi-Fi, not wireless? That card will give you wireless. They'll, they'll give you the other stuff to find. Contact info um, on Twitter. My name is at Radis. My GitHub is CRadis. There's a long story behind that. Um, it goes back to an IRC fight many, many moons ago when puppies were old and the internet was still ran by six companies. On Freenode, you can find me as Radis, and then my blog, where I've done a lot of talking about getting these devices working on the Raspberry Pis, is Radis.net. Thank you for coming. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. So I've been told I want to do it specifically with Kismet because that's the that's the main underlying architecture there. That's the main tool. Um, oh, there's a slide missing. I'll pass that in a second. Um, extra slide. I want to actually work with that with Kismet which I've been told it works. But people have told me that it doesn't work with the Raspberry Pi. It just doesn't, there's not enough power there. So does it work, does it not work, I don't know. And that's where the question comes in and that's what I want to see. Um, if I can, I know of a very large automotive company that's already offered to buy this off me multiple times because it's cheaper than Cisco. Um, people have asked me a lot of times, any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know. I haven't looked at it that way. You, you just took me off into a new section. I'm like looking for something new to do, so maybe I'll do that. Um, yeah, I've got and I've got six of those sitting at home. It's like, should I bring those with me this weekend? No, I'm not going to have time to work on those. Um, any other questions? So there's one slide I, I made last night that didn't make it to the final deck, and I don't know why. Um, I don't know if it got deleted while I was fixing something else. A lot of people have asked me about SIM integration and plugging these into SIMs, so you don't have to look at Kismet's window. And you can go look at your nice, pretty SIM instead. Um, I tried making this work last night with Alien Vaults. I couldn't get Alien Vault to start in VM. I don't know why. Um, two o'clock in the morning, I'm not going to sit there and spend half the night troubleshooting something. I've done that before, and I'm getting too old for that. Um, I'm pushing 40, so yeah, I'm getting too old for that. The old nighters are behind me, sadly. Stop aging, don't get old. Um, that's what you should, youngers over here. Stop aging, don't get old. You won't be able to pull old nighters. Um, Alien Vault actually has hooks into it. So if we go back to... I've got all these nice little log files now from Kismet. Alien Vault has the hooks. I point it to the server. I say, go find these, find these server logs. It'll pull this data into Alien Vault for you. So you've got SIM integration. I just haven't done it yet, but there's plenty of documentation out there on the net for it. And with that, anything else? Have a great rest of the weekend. Thanks for coming out.